Well, hello there. And I'm going to try this in Spanish. Eso es el Agostino Zinga show. Conmigo, Agostino Zinga. Um, episodio 361. I think that should be right. But regardless, how are you guys doing? How are you guys feeling? Top of the morning to you, top of the afternoon, and sometime before the evening. Welcome back to the Agostino Zinga show with me, your host, <coughs> Agostino Zinga. Good cough break there, right in the beginning to get the lungs going. If it's your first time tuning into the show and you like what you see, you like what you hear, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe and leave me a comment down below. If you're listening via the podcast app, please leave me a five star review and share the show with your friends. And if you want to support the show via Patreon, you can do so via the link down below, patreon.com forward slash Agostino. That's patreon.com forward slash Agostino, A-G-O-S-T-I-N-H-O for as little as one dollar or the equivalent of one pound twenty per month you can get access to my full audio library of podcasts that's full hd before everyone gets on their feed before it's available on itunes or spotify you can get access to my entire library of over 300 podcasts via patreon if you subscribe below patreon.com forward slash agostino patreon.com forward slash agostino it's in the descriptions click that subscribe get involved man oh man how's it going how you feeling what's up are you okay are you having a good day you just woken up. Um, are you about to wake up? You've just woken up. You walked out your room. Uh, you stepped on a bit of Lego that your kids dropped or that you accidentally bought because you're one of those weird adults that buys Lego. Do they still exist? Remember, that was a thing, right? I'm not sure if there's many. I don't know, because toys are... I don't... <laughs> depends. If you're an adult and you're into toys, are you still buying the same ones or have you kind of developed your taste? Because I'd imagine even if you bought Legos back in the day, there's so many cool toys now at the moment out right figurines and all that good stuff that you'd kind of want to maybe you know try something new than just playing around with bricks all day but maybe you know if you're a lego person you're a lego person to the death they just imagine man like trying to be an adult that's into toys and then having kids i remember that was one of the biggest headaches i had when i was growing up living at home being a sneakerhead and growing up with two little brothers who continually kept stealing your shoes, stealing, borrowing my trainers, right? And taking them and it's like fucking them up and just a constant battle of like, God or Mike, so come in my room and taking my stuff, man. And you just give up after a moment. You're like, you know what? I live at home. I'm just gonna have to put up with people just, you know, your stuff goes missing when you live at home and you've got siblings. It is what it is. Um, I can only imagine what may happen if you're an adult and you collect toys. Just imagine. You've got toys in your room toys around your house that you look at not as toys but as like um they're like pieces of art to you but your kid doesn't think that your kid doesn't look at that action figure of goku and think oh yeah it's a piece of art they look at it as a toy they're gonna rip that thing out of the box and start playing around with it pretend it's a bloody horse or whatever and you come back home absolutely fuming because that box alone is worth a grand do you know what i mean Ugh. But I guess you have to put it in storage or get a little man cave for yourself, which is super, 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 super weird, right? Having to run away from your family and go in your little man cave so you can play with your toys. That is, you know, not sure there'll be many women out there that would be willing to put up with that, let alone men. Imagine that. Let alone anyone, any partner, right? doesn't matter what gender you are. Um, imagine, you know, it's probably hard enough having a partner that's like, that has a lot of extracurricular activities, right? They play sports, um they're part of a big friendship group, right? It's pretty difficult to balance that in a relationship. They imagine if they have toys and they have a man cave, like... <sighs> does not sound fun. Anyway, this is the Exynos Zinger Show, episode number 361. Um, thanks again for tuning in. Action-packed show for you today. Loads of stuff to get into, loads of bits of cultural news and commentary that I'm going to provide on this hallowed platform. So grab yourself a drink. I've got myself a last remnants of a bit of water but whatever you have next to you grab it enjoy sit back and let's get into the topics so um topic number one and something that's kind of come out of the blue that no one really expected i, I think not anyway i assume not um leonel messi the um, one of the greatest players in the world top two right you could probably interchange messi and Cristiano Ronaldo, depending on your taste of players and what you like to see um, in your superstar football players have decided that his time has come up at Barcelona 
He wants to move. He wants to go somewhere else. He's decided he actually wants to leave. This happens quite often whenever Barcelona have like a bit of a lackluster season in the Champions League, a lackluster effort in the La Liga. There always tends to be rumours around Messi and his future. Um, of course, it feels like um, it makes sense because I think Messi's move was probably three years too late. I think the era of the no, I think the era of the individual superstar sort of like steering a team to glory has been and gone. I think now in the like in the kind of um, in the vein of what Liverpool did with the league and Premier League and what what kind of um, obviously Bayern Munich have done with the Champions League and to certain parts Real Madrid with the La Liga. Um, teams now are about it's about the teams. It's about the squad depth. It's about your ability to um, keep the pressure on. Um, or to essentially swap out a poor performer for somebody equally as good. That's where the top teams separate themselves, right? If your Perisic is not performing, you've got Coleman to come on and vice versa. Um, then you've got Sane and Nabry fighting for a two for one position. That's where I think top teams are really starting to separate themselves and really starting to collect big trophies. I think the area of like having a Messi in a pretty substandard Barcelona team and him single handedly pulling them over the line to win the Liga, to win Copa del Rey, to win Champions League is gone. You can't do that. You may be able to achieve that here and there, fluke, a little anomaly in time. But I think by and large, you need to build a team and a squad around these superstars so that if they do get injured or if they're not performing, you have other people that can step up. And I guess with Barcelona's case, um, mismanaging of funds to their level, like, you know, United fans such as myself like to complain about our lack of um, our lack of nous when it comes to the market. But um, Barcelona have had some pretty epic um, struggles in terms of the players they've signed, right? Um, De Jong hasn't been a success really, mostly based on the position he's played, but they paid a lot of money for him. Obviously, Dembele's not been a success. Griezmann's not been a success. Then you think about all the strikers they've signed that haven't really um, f um, kind of uh, lived up to the potential of eventually taking away the number nine shirt from Suarez. That hasn't happened. Suarez has essentially run himself into the ground and lost his pace over time, which was probably one of his strongest assets. Apart from his control and his finishing ability, his ability to run in behind players, run in behind defenders, um, you know, was really kind of one of his real, real strong suits. And now he's lost that. He essentially has turned into like a penalty box striker. And, you know, uh, Barcelona probably don't need that kind of luxury at the moment, especially with his advancing ages. So it makes sense that Messi would think, you know what, now's the time to leave. And if there's ever been an asterisk next to Messi's career, it would be that he's been a one club man. It would be that he hasn't actually necessarily tested himself in other leagues. I think there is a weird conglomerate of people out there who think La Liga week in week out is easy I don't think that's true I think we see whenever a team outside the top two top three faces an English side in the Champions League or Europa League they do give us a bit of a test they give us a run for their money I think maybe the intensity and the power of course in the Liga isn't the same as it is in the Premier League but I think technically or as footballers La Liga is as good as any league out there um, but I just think after a while, you lose your motivation. I think we've seen with Messi in the last couple of seasons, he's not really cut the most um, enthusiastic figure on the pitch. Um, he walks a lot anyway during the, during matches, if you watch cameras that are specifically trained on him. But it feels like they went above and beyond. It feels like he was doing it a little bit more often this season, especially in the previous game against Bayern Munich. Um, when Barca faced Bayern Munich, sorry, he didn't really look like he was... Um, up for it as soon as it went as soon as it went past you know over four goals he kind of resigned himself to never really trying to recover that game in any way shape or form and now the news has come out unfortunately for other Premier League fans that Messi's chosen to go to Man City and um, if you're a, if you're a supporter of any club in the Premier League that's competing for trophies or dare I say competing for the champ for the Premier League title you should be very afraid man this is bad news for the whole entire league. If anything, being objective, I'd say Messi's decision to go to City, if this is true, um, supposedly this Marcelo Betcher guy, Betcher, sorry, guy was the person that broke the news about Dembele and a few other people. He's very close to Barcelona, has a really credible sources there. So when he says that, unfortunately, it's definitely going to be true. Um, the issue at hand is that it's actually the best decision for him to make. For of all the clubs that he could have gone to, I think as a football purist it would have been amazing to see him play at PSG I think a front three of Mbappe Neymar and Messi would just have been ridiculous was that M&M it would have been absolutely insane to see all three of those players interchanging playing as a false nine 
um, and just tearing the obviously the uh, league onto pieces, but most importantly the um, the Champions League. I think that would have really stepped him up a level. Um, of course, you've got clubs like United who co- could be in for him. I guess we have the clout and the prestige, but I don't think the money's there as we've seen with the protracted transfer saga with Jaden Sancho. I just don't think we have the money to buy a player like him or to even pay his wages. Um, and if anything, it'll probably do us more harm than good signing a Messi anyway in general. I think we have a lot more bigger problems in terms of infrastructure to club to deal with as opposed to going to sign a player like Messi. And um, that's really it, really. Yeah, he could have he could have maybe pulled the ultimate Judas and went to Real Madrid, but I don't think he would do that. He doesn't really strike me as having the kind of Luis Figo temperament. He does seem a bit more of a. Um, he probably does seem maybe a little bit more agreeable than the Figo, I guess, in that regard. So it probably does make sense. He's going to go work underneath Pep Guardiola, who he maybe he wasn't the most successful. Um, period of his career in terms of winning trophies but it was the time when he possibly did play some of his best football as an individual and as part of a team you know that's when I remember Messi being at his pomp right because nowadays it feels as if like you know especially when um, <coughs> especially when um, the former manager was there before Kiki um, what's his flipping name Ugh. the former manager that was there prior I felt as if underneath his stewardship it was just like pass the ball to Messi in the final third. There wasn't any kind of uh, pattern of play that would result in the final ball landing to Messi, right? That's, I think, what um, that's essentially what Pep Guardiola did, isn't it? He built a plan or a team around Messi, but also he created a system that would result in the ball ending up in certain areas of the pitch, whether it was far back, or whether it was a left backs, whether it was um, right on the wings, whether it was in a box and around the box. There were these balls that end up having to be somewhere so that people could latch onto them. So if it was a Messi or it was another player, then so be it. But I think that would probably be the best way to him to go forward. Man City obviously play possession based football. They dominate most possession of their games, 70% and up. And, you know, this, the kind of profile of their player they, they sign is similar to a Messi. Um, you've got a lot of Spanish players there, a lot of foreign players there. Um, it just makes complete sense, do you know what I mean? And, and as we've seen with a lot of these South American players, a lot of the enjoyment of football, a lot of the joy they get out of it comes from their ability to obviously play football, but also the happiness of their family feel living in a place that they're living in. So if Messi's partner doesn't feel comfortable where they're living, they feel as if they're not making friends, um, you know, they don't speak the language that work that great, it's going to be an issue about him performing on, on the pitch. So if he really does kind of owe it to himself. If you are going to make this change late in your career, it has to be perfect. You can't get it wrong because he probably hasn't got many moves left after this, right? He probably... I don't know, it depends what you look at, but I would say he's probably at the top level got what? Maybe three more seasons left in him? <coughs> Depending. Obviously, he's not as like genetically, physically gifted as like a Cristiano Ronaldo, but I still think he's got the intelligence um, to do a good job at a high level for a long time. I kind of look at him like what, not, not to compare him, but I think it's similar to what happened to Ryan Giggs. Ryan Giggs started off his career at United as like a flying winger, right? or well, that's what he was kind of best known for. And then over time, when his pace sort of um, left him, he became a really cultured centre midfielder in some regard, you know, not obviously competitive or up and down the pitch, but in terms of delivering balls behind the back line, over the top, feeding it through the channels, like he was pretty decent. And I think Messi's got, you know, far more technical ability than Ryan Giggs. So imagine what he could do if he drifts in inwards and stop hanging out on the left or right hand side. So interesting to go forward. I think, again, um, for other teams in the Premier League, especially over. If you're trying to win the Premier League, there's no point. Um, Man City have definitely won it if they end up signing Bus. If they end up sending Messi, it's completely over. Um, again, because I just think, you know, Guardiola's made... It's not going to be a one-man team. They've got a lot of threats all over the park in that side. Um, he's definitely going to make it be, a, in effect, a place where, you know, they play a certain type of football and it ends up in Messi's feet. But it's not going to be just left to him alone to win the games. And I think... Um, the competitive nature of the Premier League, the fact that a lot of defenders will actually relish playing against him, right? They're going to want to stick the boot into Messi, kind of have that as part of their legend, part of their law. I think it'll be the best out of him. I think we'll actually see the best out of Messi, like being, you know, um, really challenged and hurt by big, burly Premier League defenders trying to make a name for themselves and him sort of, you know, hurdling the challenges and popping balls through people's legs. I think it's going to be beautiful to watch, man. I really cannot wait to see 
um, Messi in the Premier League if that does happen. Again, if it does end up in the Premier League, next place I'd like to see him is probably PSG, you know, just as a final football. But Man City looks like the fair and the most logical sorry, option to go to if you're a Messi. Da, 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 da. What else we have here? We have oh, this really cool, really good article, actually. A really insightful article by um, Philip. Or was it Phil, De Br- Phil Brown? Is that his name? Maybe yeah, Phil Brown from Twitter. Uh, a really prominent journalist. Um, Irish journalist that lives, I think, in the States now. A big United supporter who kind of consistently putting out a lot of good information, providing a lot of behind-the-scenes info on what's going on, transfer rumors, all that good stuff. And he, like a lot of fans, like myself, is kind of, you know, we've resigned ourselves to accepting that United is no longer the force that we once were. <clears throat> We're run by people, the Glazers, who are essentially looking at United as a cash cow. They're not looking at it as a place to win trophies in order to kind of boost their cash cow. They're essentially, you know, riddling us with debt and taking out copious amounts of money and just having United be part of their portfolio, but not doing anything to make us competitive on the football pitch. And if you look at what City are doing, if you look at what Arsenal have done, if you look at Tottenham, what they're trying to do with their stadium and their training facilities... And then you look at what we're doing as a club and we've made no signings. We don't look like we're linked with people. We probably need about three minimum signings, if not five, um, to go into our first team squad or first or, or even our first team to replace some people who are probably dead wood or to probably put a fire up somebody's asses and kind of get them performing a little bit better. Nothing's happening. Zero. You don't hear anything. They spent most of their time trying to go after Jaden Sancho in a deal that I think isn't probably going to happen. I think it's going to be one of those deals that eventually the club gets bored of trying to negotiate with United and they soon realise that we're not going to pay the asking price because we don't have the money. That's why we're probably offering instalments. And then they're going to pass and then next season someone's going to slap him up. You know it's going to happen. You just know it. So um, Phil had enough and written this really great op-ed that, oddly enough, got a reaction from United. United actually replied off the back of this op-ed that he wrote, which was pretty scathing of the regime of what they've done. Pretty scathing of Ed Woodward, who's probably, you know, one of the, the worst, if not the worst, if not, has to be one of the worst chief executives in football. Has to be. Um, hasn't got a clue. Former accountant or financier that now pretends to play football agent, manager, director. Hasn't got the scoobiest of idea what he's doing. And has been a person who has somehow, even though managers at United get sacked, even though players get hounded out, he seems to be the only person that's impervious to any kind of punishment of getting let go. He's overseen five failed managers and there's not been any inkling that he's ever, his position is ever going to be in jeopardy. We've got no football director. We've got no... Um, football people in higher positions um, of power or influence in the squad or in a team or in an organization and here we are but it says phil's um, article it says manchester is being destroyed from within it says um, since 2012 it has been an unmitigating disaster everything that's great about united happened prior to his tenure since then they've gone from one calamity to the next and people responsible for those calamities have even ha, have, haven't even once hinted they'll hold themselves accountable instead they appoint new manager after new manager giving the illusion of change when it's nothing more than an optical illusion it's truly unfathomable that ed woodward and his stars could inherit a football club in the condition that they did and proceed to run it into the ground and leave it in a position where we have to go back to the 70s to find the last time united finish this far behind the leaders no other football club in the world would tolerate this level of ineptitude take a look at Bayern Munich a football club run by football people who are who make football decisions because they know why they're making them everything at the club is synchronized the academy players the academy plays in the image of the first team and by the time the they need they reach maturity they can be surgically brought in to the youth team to play in the first team so it continues going on about some of the failings I think the last paragraph here is really good <coughs> the last two it says the following the na- new season is four weeks away the only thing united have managed to do is move players on from the squad that was razor thin in the first place the first half of the last season 100 percent down to the club not signing the players it needs to fulfill the primary objective win football games the men who fill those suits and who are responsible for running this club are almost offended when they are criticized at all they won't feel responsible for leaving the club short in the summer and they certainly won't do so in the same this season Solskjaer got them out of jail. He saved every single one of them. They owe him, yet they behave like the opposite is true. Every year, the highlight clips gets older. The people of the present are forced to bask in the glory of the era they had nothing to do with. 
As Chelsea move closer to signing Kai Havertz, the imposters who run this football club will shamelessly sit on their hands. Last paragraph, it says they will, th they will think nothing of starting the season a month from now with the squad exactly as it is. <clears throat> as United is, um, sorry, at United there's always money, as you know, there's always money for everything but football. There's always money for dividends, always money for massive executive bonuses, always enough to cover the mistakes of people who do not who do not have once demonstrated that um, they possess the capabilities to run the football club. I pray against all hope that the magic wand is waved, competence is found, and Solskjaer is given the players that he asks for. But history is the greatest predictor of the future, and it's just otherwise. Many United fans will react with anger, uh, then apathy at another disappointing summer. But the inevitable failures happen next season. People, please direct your anger beyond the manager, which is true. And again, it's I've resigned myself to it. I think I came to that realization pretty soon. Maybe my kind of breaking point was when we sold Ronaldo. I think that summer, Ronaldo and Tevez, and we brought in. I'm gonna say Antonio Valencia, Michael Owen, and maybe Obertown was the same window. That's when I lost some of my hope. And then I remember that's when Michael Owen got the number seven. Fair enough, Michael Owen went on to score that winner against City. Cool, great. He had a couple of other good games and he's in, you know, he just made out of paper, and it? It's not his fault. But letting go of Carlos Tevens or Cristiano Ronaldo and then bringing in those three players, Obertan, um, Tony Valencia and Michael Owen, really was a signal of how far we'd fallen. Obviously, um, bloody, you know, Sir Ferguson, a genius, ended up winning us a title, I think, after that, see, after those signings too and a few other trophies. But, that was mostly his genius. The moment he stepped away from the club, the whole cards came tumbling down and we don't have any way, there's, and there's not been any inkling so far that they were going to fix it. We, we looked at one option, which was maybe getting a football director in, right, who would essentially come in and, you know, you'd hope that that one person would find all the other gaps that exist in the club and try and modernise it, right, try and kind of bring it dragging and screaming to the uh, 21st century. But that didn't happen because guess what? The people that are in charge now who have cushy jobs doing nothing and compiling reports on players will never sign. They don't want to be put in a position where a football director comes in and starts questioning their position or eventually ends up firing them or eventually takes away positions of power and influence away from them. And that's actually what's happening. Or even something like Ed Woodard who kind of acts as if like he's got any kind of football acumen and so far he's demonstrated none whatsoever. He should be somebody that's falling on his sword, but he hasn't. Instead, he points a finger at managers, uh, points a finger at players. You get you get fed, you know, they kind of leak stories about certain players, a lack of performance and effort and desire. When really, if you look at it, the recruitment of that club, of this club that I support, the objectives that we have have been completely against everything that we stand for. And now look at Vision that we're in. So that's why I don't really get angry because I resign myself to it. I know that this will continue on um, and it will only stop or only end when the Glazers leave. When the Glazers are brought out of the club or eventually end up selling out, um, this is the only way it's going to change. It won't change before that. It's not going to change. It won't change. You won't see our fortunes change whatsoever. We won't win another Champions League. No, let's not get that straight. We won't be the force that we were prior until those guys leave. We might win a cup here and there because it's a cup competition. I can't say we never win a Champions League. But in terms of being an actual, you know, competing, dominating force in the Premier League like we were prior, you know, where third was a, third was might as well be relegation i don't think we'll be there again until the glazers leave it's just a really shocking set, uh, set of events and um as they are united nowadays because they don't like to be embarrassed in public they decided to reply to phil with one of the most wishy-washy empty replies i've ever seen in my life this kind of reminds me a lot of the replies and the comments you'd get back from working in certain startups right i worked in one particular startup with this you know absolute dickhead of a guy called nicholas oliver who ended up scamming everybody in the company and not paying them any money and you know running off with um loads of investment from people that he didn't pay back and racking up massive amounts of debts and he had a really great talent of kind of saying a lot of words without saying anything right it's a really particular skill that you kind of acquire once you start running a startup you have to have the ability to kind of sell people dreams and kind of dangle the carrot in front of their face right without actually committing to anything and i guess this is essentially what united have done with this statement that they released to phil um kind of addressing some of the concerns that he put in his statement which you know in his article which is pretty clear and damning about what he thinks who the uh, who the blame should be where the blame should be laid um if that does get dished at the end of the season so this is united replying right look at us replying absolute joke of a club it says here in response to my article on the btpmedia.net title Manchester united are being destroyed from within the club has since emailed me to state their position and to make it clear i appreciate the willingness of the club to engage and dialogue and issue a response so here's their response 
Manchester United has been consistent in its position regarding recruitment since the start of the COVID crisis. So what? No one knows your position because we don't have any... It's as if they're going on as if like, we have some sort of like defined football identity. The thing that they're kind of pinning their hopes on now at the moment is fucking, um, what? Uh, Brexit FC, right? This idea that we're kind of doing a cultural reset by not signing any flamboyant foreign players, which is already questionable, right? Anyone that's not European-based or British for the most part, um, that doesn't colour their hair in a weird way or wear wacky clothes outside of football, that's the players that we're trying to sign, right? That's what it looks like. Questionable, but I get it. Fair enough. Do your thing. <clears throat> but it's not mind-blowing. It's not that forward-thinking. It's not going to close the gap on the champions. It is what it is. It's a sensible buying decision, but it's not anything to shout home about. It continues, it says the club points out that it may, it remains committed to supporting the manager and strengthening the squad over the long term. What does that mean? It means that we're not going to sign the people that you want now. We're going to drip feed the signings because we don't want to get them wrong and be hamstrung with six or seven signings that are error prone and then go and sign a new manager. Or they just can't get that business done because top teams are doing it. Inter Milan did it in one summer. Chelsea are in the process of maybe signing their fourth player already. Top teams can do it. Because there's no time to waste. Football waits for no man. It continues. The club also points out that this summer's transfer window will not be business as usual because of the huge economic impact of the pandemic. Tell that to Chelsea. Tell that to Real Madrid. Tell that to PSG. Tell that to, tell that to Liverpool. Tell it to Arsenal even. What are you talking about? Because of the huge economic pand uh, impact from the pandemic, both in terms of immediate loss of revenue, and then the uncertainty over the long-term impact of the crisis, of course. So that means if we sign, so I said before, if we sign Sancho, that's our lot. If we don't sign Sancho, we're going to sign two players. I've said it before. If we don't sign Sancho, we're going to sign two players, and that's going to be it. And they're going to be two very underwhelming players. They won't even be the Grealishes. They'll be somebody else super shit, like a Brooks or something that's not, you know, it's, it might be a good squad player, injury-prone youngster, but he's not going to get us next to, he's not going to get us competing with PSG and Bayern Munich. It's not going to happen. So just resign yourself to that if you're a United fan. And then thirdly, um, what's here? Da, 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 da. United point United's point of view is that these harsh economic realities means the club must be cautious this summer to ensure the club preserves the strength throughout this difficult period. What does that even mean? Like, what does it mean? The new season starts in a few weeks. In September, I think, right? Like, what is this? What are you talking about? There is no time. We're essentially playing two seasons in like two years or in one year sorry right one and a bit years you have to just get your business done sooner rather than quickly sooner rather than later so you can make a long-term decision as to whether you're going to stick to those players or not look at city they buy a couple of right backs they don't like they sell them and sign a couple of more sometimes valued even more than the ones that they previously signed like ugh, we're a joke of a club absolute mess but again it's no surprise this is always been, this is always going to be on the cards. The moment the Glazers rocked up at United, that was when my club died. And until that ends, until that changes, we're not going to be a competing force in world football ever again. We might win your cup here and there, but to get back where we were, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. But yeah, what can you do? What can you do? No point again. I'm upset about that because I can't do it. Anything I can do is just not buy anything from the club i don't buy any replica jerseys um i don't buy any other bits of merch from them i don't give them any more money than i have to get give them i don't want to give them anything because i don't feel that infused by what's going on the direction of the club is there is no direction it's rudderless we're essentially hoping that social just gets it right on his own in his own way if he gets it right it's gonna be it's to no benefit and it's to no credit to the board at all or to the club as a, to the people in the head office they've got nothing they've got no they should have no sense of uh, achievement or accomplishment in that whatsoever because it'd just be all down to him it'll be all down to social shock man, man, managing the squad well managing his fitness well managing expectations signing well based on the recommendations he gets from maybe friends in football or people within the club but it won't be anything to do with the united board nothing whatsoever absolutely shocking man absolutely shocking but what can you do next on the list we've got unfortunate developments on this really horrible story in the states which i mentioned previously at the top of the show and you know again i don't really have much really that i can say in this situation i don't live in the states 
Um, so I try to keep my nose out of, you know, um, politics in other countries. We've got enough issues to deal with here. But the issue of police brutality in America is a big one, isn't it? And it's, a, it's something that doesn't necessarily, similar to the kind of debate they used to have in America whenever there was a really big school shooting um, or any, any type of school shooting, there used to be a debate around gun control and it never really went anywhere. Um, it seemed like a lot of people in the States had resigned themselves to the idea that, hey, you know, we've got a constitution and it tells us we have the right to bear arms. Um, sometimes things will have some bad things will happen with that right, but we can't give up the right. Um, in sp we can't give up the right. Basically, we're willing to accept a few school shootings to have our right to bear arms, and I think that's what they basically silently kind of agreed on. And I feel like in the states with police brutality, especially towards minorities, they've sort of re they sort of kind of re um, resigned themselves to the idea that this will never change. It's institutional. <coughs> <coughs> It feels like you can never convince people who live, work in the police force that they're maybe being a bit too excessive. You can never convince the unions. You can never convince the captains. You can't convince anybody on that side of the wall or the blue side of the wall that they're doing anything untowards to the civilians or citizens of the United States in the way that they kind of deal with them when it comes to an arrest. So there's no resolution. There's nothing in sight. And unfortunately, even off the back of the George Floyd death, there's still instances of really grave police brutality encounters um you know that just don't need to get to that level that's the issue as well it's like not there's there's been a few where the person that's passed away has you know they've only have themselves to blame of how they conduct themselves with police but most of the time they're innocuous enough that they don't need to escalate to the point where the, a police officer has to draw his gun and point it towards your face it doesn't need to go that far but they do and this story is more complicated because if you watch the video Jacob Blake, um, the guy that got shot in Kinshasa, um, was essentially resisting arrest, if you look at the video. Um, we don't know if the story is true about him breaking up a fight, but let's say it is. The police rock up. Obviously, they have no idea who's fighting, so they just grab whoever's being the most aggressive in the crew. Maybe it's that guy because he's bigger, he's shouting, he's black. We don't know. Um, and then, well, I guess the video starts when they get into some kind of tussle where they're trying to arrest him or they're trying to talk to him and he's not listening um he kind of breaks away free from them i guess in that scurry they or in that skirmish they um hit him with a taser he doesn't go down like some people don't go down he ends up opening his passenger seat door bends down underneath the console and then i guess um because the police officers felt scared they whilst he was had his back to them shot him seven times in the back seven which is just absolutely insane. And now they've got non-stop riots in the States. Non-stop riots. People are burning their local community down because they feel like they're not being listened to. And I just don't see a resolution, unfortunately. And again, from the outside looking in, as an English guy, if ever there was something that was going to give Trump a bit of a... that was going to swing the balance back into Trump's favour, this would be it. Some of the polls out there, if you believe what you read, say that Joe Biden is leading... And he end up he he might end up sneaking it when this election day, but I've got a feeling that this I don't know if you call him the radical left or whatever you kind of describe him as these people that go out and antagonize police officers after a fatal incident involving a minority, and they burn down local premises they you know they finish people's businesses they just can be an entire nuisance I think they end up helping Trump's re-election they really do I honestly do and think they do because I think. The people that are already in the middle and don't want to vote for Trump or Biden because they feel like they're both bad choices um, or people that have become disillusioned with the Democratic Party will definitely look at what's happening in places like Portland um, and just think, you know what, this country is like dead. We need someone to come in with an iron fist or appear to be an iron fisted leader and restore some sort of law and order because, you know, you just can't keep going on like this. Um, so this is an article from The Guardian. It says, two dead in Kenosha on third night of unrest after Jacob um, Blake's shooting, which is even more tragic now. Other people are dying as a consequence um, of this one man losing his life. So it's the following. It says, two people were shot dead and another injured when at least one gunman opened fire on protesters in Kenosha, Wisconsin, amid demonstration um, against the police shooting of Jacob Blake three days ago. David Beth, the county sheriff, said one person was shot in the head and another in the chest just before midnight on Tuesday. Another was shot in the arm. The victims have not been identified. Beth said people describing themselves as belonging to a militia that had been patrolling potential streets in recent nights, but he did not know the shooter was involved in such a group. He says they're a militia. Uh, they're a little vigilante group. 
He says a video post on social media showed a chaotic scenes as gunfire rang out, scattering people in the street. One of the victims, a young shirtless white man with a red bandana around his neck, was seen receiving first aid in the car park after being shot in the head. In another image, a man sat down on the ground with his arms almost severed by a gunshot wound. God almighty. It's just, it's insane, isn't it? Like, again, just imagine living in a, in a pandemic times and then you're essentially... Um, taking part in civil acts of civil war um with your neighbors it's just wild especially in these like smaller states or these smaller yeah these smaller towns in a in like a no man place state like i'm assuming wisconsin is <sighs> was it massachusetts i don't know what state that is no no um he says the third night of protests against um the police shooting of blake who was hit with uh, almost point blank range multiple times in the back had attracted supporters of black lives matter and the armed rival protesters have gathered in near patrol station i'm assuming that's antifa i'm not sure why they're not mentioning them uh, is it are you not allowed to use the word antifa or something i don't know but they haven't mentioned it so images of the rival group showed heavy armed heavy armed white men some wearing body armor um according to all their problems i don't know according to the witness reports the two groups had increasingly come into con conflict at the night um as the night wore on, the police fired tear gas and rubber bullets at demonstrators near Kenosha Court House. Social media users posted a series of images, including a video that appeared to show the same individual at a key point during the confrontation. The young white man first appears wearing a bag of t-shirt. Let's continue here. There were 35 fires of show associated with the unrest, with 30 businesses destroyed or damaged, along with an unknown number of residencies, the Kenosha Fire Department Chief Charles Leipzig told the Kenosha Times. And then the worst, the worst bit is this, isn't it, right? That's the worst bit. Blake, Jacob Blake, the guy that got shot in his back by police officers as he's going to reach for something in his car, has now been left paralyzed and still fighting for his life. I'm surprised he's still alive. Getting shot seven times, I guess maybe because, I don't know, I can't even describe why that mass happened, but usually it's if you get shot in your body mass um, more than three times, you're usually pronounced dead on the scene. So to get shot seven times and still be alive is really, really wild. Um, says the Wisconsin governor, Tony Evers, had called for calm on Tuesday while he also declaring a state of emergency under which he had doubled a National Guard deployment in Kenosha to 250 like shocking and then i guess we'll end it with a couple of videos here um the damage is just wild man absolutely wild. and again i just i would hope there'd be a conversation now that surrounds you know the way black people in america interact with the police because it does seem like they get a bit too spicy especially i don't know we, we get a bit rude here in the uk we are some some of you go to ends and you see some boys they can sometimes be a bit too confrontational with people in um uniform but usually it's done in a kind of banter, jesty way. But in America, these guys are really up for the, they're up for the conflict. And I guess I would be in a position where if I had somebody that was trained to, you know, I don't know, quell the noise outside or, you know, whatever, whatever they're trained to do, police officers, right? Uh, keep the peace. The last thing I'd want to do is kind of antagonize them to the point they draw their gun out. You know, I wouldn't want to do that. And this is a really sad video, I guess, from... Um, on Twitter, it shows here. Let's play from the beginning. Uh, what's it doing now? Okay, let's play from the, play from the beginning here, right? The, the, it's just from Twitter. It says here, I spoke um, with Scott and his mother, Linda. Their furniture store was set on fire last night during the Kenosha riots, and Linda cried at the side of the wreckage. Like, God almighty. <laughs> Life is hard enough as it is, and imagine that. Just imagine. Just imagine. <laughs> And it's legit gone too. It's legit gone. It's legit gone. Look at it. It's legit gone. It's mad, man. Look at that. Wow. Wow. The insurance isn't there so somebody can destroy and exactly your things and say, oh well, there's insurance. Um, that's wild that. you know we pay for insurance that causes insurance rates to go up it's basically that they just stole from us whoever did this stole from us and that raises the cost of everything cost of living goes up because of that cost of insurance goes up when, when insurance claims have to be made surely if you're a sensible rational person that has a heart 
and you can't bring yourself to being a Republican, right? Because I guess in America it's different. Like it seems like I don't know, in this in the UK we have we do have conservatives or Tories that can be somewhat, you know, compassionate to the plight of the working class. But it, it does appear as if, you know, there is a completely different vibration in the States. And I think if you were somebody that was on the fence about, you know, aligning yourself to the Democratic Party, uh, for better or worse, you would maybe have in the back of your mind thinking, you know what, maybe I should step over to the right side of the aisle, right? To, wear, to wearing a red side, to wearing a red tie part of the team. You might want to do that because this is just insane. You can't, there's, you can't relate to this, right? There's nothing that you, this would make more sense if it was like, okay, this state is blue. They love, you know, they want free healthcare. They want free money, right? All this sort of stuff that Republicans are always angry about. So we're going to go to their state. And we're going to trash it and tell them, hey, there's only one place you should be voting for. One team is the Republican Party, right? Sort of like old school mob tactics, right? Where a shop owner refuses protection from a mobster and he comes back and basically lights the place on fire. Um, that would make sense, isn't it, right? The Proud Boys rocking up and saying, hey, you guys need to stop voting blue and vote red. But it's not. It's people from their own tribe. It's people who kind of attest to be, what, ACAB, right? Um, all Cops of Bastard or Antifa. That's the people that are usually actually protesting. And then they go around burning people's businesses. It's like, God almighty, man. And yeah, this is just more coverage from there. A young woman outside of Kenosha County Court shouts, kill the police. Oh, my God. Tell the fucking police, kill them back. And imagine being a fed and hearing that it's just so wild man it really is people burning the american flag outside the courthouse which you know symbolic i guess but the flag was a bit dead super small we were trying to break the gates down it reminds you of something you'd seen a scene from the french revolution right that's what sort of reminds you of of, of of that what's that movie where they um they take over the embassy is it argo it kind of reminds me of the opening scene in argo jesus christ writers are now throwing projectiles at police and no one's got jobs too so imagine that so this is a funny thing the cut juxtaposed you've got this happening and then on the other side of town you have dnc conventions people dancing and singing and talking about all the wonderful things they're going to do when they're in power and then you've got the republicans at their republican national convention where they're essentially shouting and screaming that the world's going to burn in flames if you let the democrats take over right but no one's address no one's addressing what's currently going on no one's telling americans um what the future holds how long they're going to have to lock in place how long they're gonna to have to go without meals how they go long they're gonna to have to go without a job how long they go go without meaning without a cruise without the ability to go to a bar a, you know a hole in a wall go to their favorite restaurant go and buy some clothes at macy's that they have no indication of when that's going to return to normal no indication instead riots it's just wild man absolute wild times uh police at kenosha county courthouse shoot pepper balls that shit what Pepper balls using shields that enable the comrades to throw projectiles. <laughs> An armored police. An armored police car. After giving multiple warnings, the crowd dispersed because it's an unlawful assembly. The police came out. More flares. And people running and scurrying for hell. Oh, big bang there. Let's hit that. That is wild, isn't it? Absolutely wild scenes, man. A lot happening right now. Writers are breaking up rocks to see if it's easy to throw. One writer is breaking a window. Please continue to use armored trucks to push writers away. And it's such a weird fight to do, too, because none of these guys are armed. I don't think a lot of them. You're facing police who have copious amounts of weapons and, you know, weapons that they could use with lethal force. Bloody hell. More confrontations between writers and citizens. A fire started in a parking lot, of course, another one. Because I'm assuming most parking lots have cars that are, you know, full of fuel, I'm assuming. Easy to burn. This looks like tires, but Jesus Christ. Shocking state of affairs. Oh, this is the one with the shooting, right? The guy falls over and starts shooting people. That's an absolutely wild video, I think. He falls over. Like, 
like, what the hell is going on, man? Legit, what's going on, man? The world's on fire. And these politicians are going around, what? Telling us nothing. No no sense of ending to this in, in continuing doom. It's absolutely wild. Wild scenes, man. If you're in the States, let me know, man. If you live in Wisconsin and you're going through this at the moment, let me know how, how, how you're kind of handling it. Um, is this like a... Is this like the worst timing ever? I'm assuming you're probably hurting where you are anyway, right? Small towns probably been been they've probably been um unfairly affected by COVID. No real help, right? You know the glitzy part of town. I wonder what's going on over there. Let me know in the comments if you have any idea. If you're over on that side, I'd love to know. Next on the list we have du, 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 du. reacting. <coughs> Yeah, reacting to this news is going to be hard because it's, I'm a fan of his. But, you know, you got to call a spade a spade sometime and you can't sit on the fence and, you know, not criticize some people because you're fans of them. You have to give honest opinions and honest thoughts on every, each and every person, regardless of who they might be and regardless of your connection or affinity to them. And this is one of those people who I have to kind of uh, speak about in maybe a not so good light. So, Dixon. One of my favorite DJs, if not my favorite DJ, um, somebody who I kind of started following when I first got into dance music, electronic music, whatever you may call it. One of my kind of first DJ heroes alongside with Rich Carlo Villalobos, uh, DJ Harvey, Jeff Mills. Um, the first people that I kind of saw right online, like, wow, these guys are amazing. These guys play the kind of stuff that I'd want to play. They have a certain sort of type of style. Um they just carry themselves in a certain way. They have a very um, particular way of how they view music and how they view DJing. And I just loved how they approach their artistry, right? So I'm a big fan, follow them all over the place. Dixon for, as a good example, I've seen play maybe more than 10 times um, all around the world. Um, and somebody who I is have immense respect for as a DJ and as a label head and as a general kind of artist within the dance music scene. So we have this issue going on at the moment where we have these things called plague raves that they've been dubbed by the techno Twitter lot, which is essentially high flying DJs, DJs who probably can afford to stay at home, deciding to go play in far flung places where they've decided to preemptively um, open up the economy, open up certain sectors of the economy in order to allow tourism to flood back so that they could um, support their local economy. So these are places such as Switzerland who've kind of dealt with COVID pretty well. Maybe the places like Tunisia who have essentially opened up the gates um, to the world in order to kind of boost their economy. Um, maybe it's prematurely, but they did it regardless. Places like Paris, uh, places in Germany now at the moment. There's a couple of raves happening in Berlin, such as open air events. But there's a few places in Europe where these players are kind to pop up and a lot of the big high-flying djs who probably can get away with you know not having a steady income for the past you know for six or seven months are deciding to go and play at and they're also kind of drawing a lot of criticism online because people who attend these parties aren't keeping the distance there's not a lot of face coverings it doesn't necessarily seem like a place where you can have good practices right i think that's the main reason why clubs and nightclubs and bars and stuff were closed and gyms and stuff and whatnot were told to halt especially when covid was spreading because we realized that the place where it spreads the most is in, in in confined spaces and there's no way that you can run a place like a nightclub with covid in mind and ask your punters to keep their distance because you know once alcohol gets in your system a bit of drinking a bit of drugs whatever you're doing when you're going out you're definitely not going to be able to resist the urge to get close to people it's just not going to happen so um that's what's been happening and it's it's a sad state of affairs because i think in the beginning of covid i i was under this really um naive um impression that we would kind of covid would would cause a reset in the dance music community scene would be at a point where there would be less onus on big glitzy high ticket number um you know selling artists and stuff or you know the top 10 20 voted djs on an ra list would essentially be dispersed around the global community so they're not all playing at the same places at the same time um obviously domestic promoters would have to rely on their own 
contact book domestically of artists that they can book because they couldn't get other people to travel and um, because travel restrictions will still be in place that's, that's what we assumed right we thought that was going to be the case we we're going to suddenly come out of covid um in this new climate of club space where you go to a local bar and you'll see um or you go to a local club and you'll see somebody that's really talented that lives in your area as part of your community given a chance to play on a big stage as apart from playing the usual big names because you know they can sell tickets but that, that, hasn't, that hasn't happened actually what's happened is that all the playgraves are only booking the big selling acts because they want to guarantee they get their money back because if you're going to put on an event during a global pandemic you're taking a hell of a lot of risk and you know the event could get shut down it couldn't be successful people run to buy tickets whatever the case may be you just want to guarantee that that person that's arriving is going to contribute x amount of tickets to the door regardless of what happens to the event regardless of how poly producers put together regardless and actually makes me think too um this would have been a great time for the comments on RA to be around because this is what made RA special at the time was that you could leave comments on events. So event walls and event, um, event, yeah, event listings and event walls or event comment sections on RA turn into a place where you could spot the great promoters. You could spot the people that came in like charlatans and just put a couple of active, active, active speakers in the corner of the room and just hope for the best. You could tell the promoters who essentially treated their punters like, you know, um, you know, bloody scum you can see the places where they provided a safe space all comments were kind of filled in that kind of way and since they took away those comments um there are a lot more you know shabby things going on in the scene and i think this would have been a great place for there to be a lot more dialogue and communication between punters and the people putting things together and maybe us on the outside just looking on in um and unfortunately um it's now come to my doorstep because dixon the person i huge respect had decided to do one of these playgraves in tunisia now again you know, he could easily argue and say, hey, Tunisia uh, opened up its economy. I wouldn't have gone if it's not legal to go. Um, it's legal to go. You can gather in place. You can gather in open air environments with so many people playing there. But I guess the issue is that, you know, it just sets a bad precedent. I think somebody of his stature doesn't need to play at this event. I think you don't need to leave your home to go and see. Don't get me wrong. Dix is not in the Kravitz, right? He plays far less gigs and he's obviously a lot more... Um, purposeful about where he goes and all that's kind of for good things but Dixon isn't the person that you need to break your quarantine for to go and see this isn't a once a lifetime opportunity Dixon's going to be back playing around the world maybe not exactly in Tunisia but in around the play around the world somewhere within the African continent somewhere shape or form within the next year or 18 months it's not the only time he's going to be in that region so for fans to kind of burst through the doors to get there is weird for Dixon to want to play there at this certain time as well is also strange. It also it makes you think maybe these DJs at this level don't get paid as much as you think they get paid. Or if they do get paid that much, the money is still, you know, money is relative, I guess, at that extent, right? I guess if you're a DJ who's been playing at that level as a Dixon, 20 plus years, 20 plus years in a game, playing at a ridiculously high level at all the best places with some of the best promoters, putting on some of the most memorable nights, you exp you kind of live on that budget right so i'd assume if your finances have taken a hit for the last six or seven months there's going to come a point where you need to go and make some money you need to go put food on the table you need to be able to put your kids through school and um, provide for your family you need to go and do that so i i get the rock in a hard place but i don't know man there's just something about traveling all that way to Tunisia to go put an event it just doesn't really sit right for me and the other part of it which i mentioned to before to somebody else was that it's just why is it that the dance music scene feels the need or they feel like they have the right to put on events when no other industry is doing so. You don't, or no other genre in music even, right? There's no hip hop events. There's no gigs there. There's no gigs in the indie music scene. Nothing really happening in EDM. Um, there might be some illegal raves here and there, some chain smoker events, but for the most part, they're keeping their head under, um, they're keeping um, out of the spotlight and maybe doing some stuff on Twitch and stuff. But there's no other genre that exists outside of the dance music scene that feels the need to put on events and have to DJ. And some of the DJs too, unfortunately, unfairly, I'd say, from my point of view, because I don't think it's fair to count people's pockets or tell them what they should do with their career. But if you're unable to play gigs and you need to pay for your rent, you should just go get a normal job. Like you really should. Obviously, it's going to be difficult if you've been DJing since you're 13. You've got no real life experiences, but you're going to have to get a normal job one way or the other. There's no way you can be able to play enough gigs anyway under this current conditions to afford you yeah to afford your lifestyle it's just going to be not possible right especially if you're at the entry level stage right you're getting paid what a grand to 10 grand per set it's not going to be enough anyway right that money's going to go instantly 
Um, so I guess for Dixon again, it's a concern because I think at his level, I think I read somewhere that Mac- Massio Plex or something along those lines who I'd maybe say has the same sort of booking fee as a Dixon gets paid anywhere between 10,000 to 30,000 per gig. Um, five grand I heard for after parties. If that's true, like why is Dixon playing in Tunisia? And again, not counting his pockets. It's not my business, right? To count people's pockets, not say what they're doing their money, but it's really strange. And anyway, this is a video here from Business Test, Business Testner. Uh, or business techno on Twitter that kind of you know goes out of their way to shine a light on some of our more questionable figures within the dance music scene. They put together a little video, I guess they found on Instagram a compilation of uh, Dixon playing on August the thirteenth, and I'm going to play the first one for you now. Um... And again, similar to the other videos, no dancing. Fair enough, it's a breakdown, but you know. Big Ciroc sponsorship. So good. And the sad thing about it, right, is that this looks fun and reminds you of the time, last time that we saw uh, Dixon play at Fold for the Innovision label night, like maybe one of my top five clubbing experiences. But from number one, the crowd, right, absolutely dead on their feet. No one dancing, no one interacting, people just standing, looking at him like as if he's Kasabian. That's a bit annoying. And then I guess for the as a DJ too, is this really how you picture your first gig? Is your first gig back really a gig where you just go and collect money or is it a place where you go and kind of rekindle your love for tech dance music, right? Because I remember watching this documentary recently for Pioneer where they're basically detailing um, experiences from DJs around the world about how, they, how they're going through COVID and how they're dealing with it. And Honey DJ made some really good points about she just doesn't feel like, she she doesn't feel inspired enough to even stream or to make mixes and all that good stuff and keep herself active because part of the beauty of dance music was being um, with people with the community hanging out with strangers right making putting a smile on someone's faces seeing people's emotion as you're putting on a different track and without that you know it's not the same doing it online right and it's also not the same doing it at these really corporatized events you know i saw a bit massive Ciroc sign there on the left obviously i'm um, again i don't i don't blame the decision promoters i guess if you put an event on like this you need to make sure you get your money back but is this really how you picture your first gig back just standing in front of people who are just staring at you, recording it all on their phone, not really giving a shit. Because imagine if this was an event that he did it with actual fans of the music, not actual, it's not, it's snobby to say that. But if he did that in an environment where people are more um, accustomed to getting loosed and getting on it, this would be a different vibe. Because I think like Tunisia, like the events happening in Zurich, like the events happening in Venice, like the events happening in other places, they seem to be only, um, it seems to be a really bougie crowd. I think that's what's happening. It's less about Tunisian people are not familiar with dance music because I'm sure they are. It's more so they're playing for promoters who obviously have the pockets to sub, sub, to kind of put on this kind of event. Because imagine, they, they're, they're also not having, they're also not putting on events every weekend. So their pockets are suffering. So if, if a promoter is able to put on a party and fly Dixon over to play in, a, you know, now in the middle of August, that means they have deep pockets. So usually a deep pockets would mean that they're going to put it somewhere glitzy, somewhere where there's good girls in stilettos with pencil skirts at the front door taking your name, uh, with big burly guys, a security everywhere, um, with like installations from Ciroc and shit going on. I'm assuming that's what's basically happening, but it just doesn't seem like fun to me um, as a party or as an event to go to and totally not worth it during a global pandemic, in my opinion. Um, another video here. Like, look, legitimately, look at the lack of dancing. Like, these guys aren't dancing. Like, the, this is honestly so bizarre. Same like we saw the crowds in Italy with Nina Kravitz. The same with this. And again, the Italy one is weird because I think if you look at the Kappa, is it Kappa Futures? That's probably the best dancing thing I've seen. Or maybe the crowd at DC10, that's a bit mixed. But for the most part, I don't think Italians, that's a good representation of Italians. I think that's just the crowd that goes to those kind of events um, that Nina Kravitz was playing. I think the actual Italians who are actually fans of techno and like i said before they're probably the best 
their best fans in dance music when they're your fan they really love you um i think they really get on it and they really let loose but i think that place where they put the events are at it just attracts a certain crowd it's like going it's like putting on a an event with ben clock and stuff and inviting you know guys and girls that go to the chill and firehouse it's going to be full of people like this just standing around looking cute <laughs> Like, how can he not be dancing to that? <laughs> and again, maybe for me as a as a punter, maybe there's a bit of jealousy because I can't go myself. I know for DJs, there must be a hint of jealousy. There has to be some of the people that get annoyed online. Because you would have hoped, especially if you was a middle tier DJ, like, you know, someone that plays on one of those dead online radio shows, right? Um, and you're playing a couple of bars here and there. It might be annoying that you don't have the opportunity to play in these kind of places because you feel as if this should be your opportunity to do so. And instead, they're flying around these high flying people who could probably do without. And again, doing without as well is a big assumption. You don't know what people are doing with their funds. You don't know how people live their lives. Um, I'm a big believer in, you know, the more you earn, the more your daily, I'm a big, yeah, I believe that most people do that, right? Where they, if they earn more, their daily expenses tend to go up too. So I'm sure, you know, 10 grand per gig, 30 grand per gig doesn't really, you know, make a dent that much because, you know, you are, you know, spending a lot on your shirts if you're Dixon. Uh, you're putting your kids through probably, you know, you, you, you've got your kids in a good school because you can afford to. You drive a pretty decent car, maybe a couple. You may be supporting your partner who doesn't work or works with you. There's a lot that goes into that. So I'm sure that money doesn't really go as far as they want it to go. Hence the other projects they do. But I'm sure if you're a middle tier DJ, you should be really pissed off if you're seeing this. It should be really annoying. And then the last slide, I guess, is an indication on how the situation has changed. Is this is from uh, to daily change a spike? I guess over the twenty first onwards. I guess it's, that's a week. Is it the twenty first? I think that's a week. That's why. That's why he's right. Is that why he wrote that? I think the thirteenth. Yeah, because that's how they calculate, right? It's like the week. It's like the week that follows. Um, so where they get the results. So I guess there's been a spike, and you know, if you believe if you believe the reports online uh, via the World Health Organization that most of the spikes are due in part to economies reopening and young people gathering in large groups in places where they shouldn't be gathering, and then you know, asymptomatic people spreading the virus. That's usually the kind of regular thing people are kind of going towards. So this kind of is maybe an indication on maybe the promoter shouldn't be put on in events because it does more harm than good before the case have actually been dealt with and handled in the right way. And DJs shouldn't be going because this isn't the most um, altruistic thing to do. It doesn't really have, there's no real foresight in the future. You're just kind of going there to collect your check and go home. You're not really thinking about the damage or the footprint you're going to leave um, going there at this event, right? And they're not going to, I don't know. It's just difficult to really to really figure out like i said i think the the blame should be laid at the dj's feet for accepting the gigs and going in the first place i don't think you could turn back around and start saying oh i didn't know because you knew and it should be laid at the promoter's feet for endangering their local or their their um, neighbors and their fellow citizens to this when they don't really need to go through this right they could easily put on an event at the, maybe the same scale with a local artist without having to fly people over or maybe reduce the capacity and it might not be such an issue and then the next slide, it says Tunisia COVID situation is critical. And that was on the August of 13th, the same day that um, Dixon was going to go play that rave. Um, which again is really bad, man. I think, opt like I said, it's supposed to say optics wise, yeah? Optics of a rich white European DJ traveling to an African country with inadequate COVID management and rising cases to play a play grave and get even more people sick is quite shit, isn't it? Which is true. Um, and again, I'm a big fan of Dixon, but it's hard to excuse it, man. You can't really excuse that whatsoever. There's no excuse you can be um that that would make any sense you know um again unless he just says look i need the money i had to go it is what it is even then you know it still makes you think that a lot of these people um they like to tell they like to give the impression that they care about the scene and that they're all about giving back um you know but most of these people are only playing they're only DJ. like for a lot of these people if there wasn't a lot of money in djing they wouldn't do it i don't think so i think if djs got paid Let's say if all DJs got paid what entry level DJs gets paid between 1,000 to 10 or 1,000 to 5, I don't think a lot of them will play. They won't play as much as they do at the moment. I think a lot of them go go and play so often because they're chasing a bag legitimately. I think there are a few that exist that are just freaks that, you know, they can't stay at home. They have to go outside. They have to be, you know, they have to be in between massive, you know, monitors. 
blasting techno to strangers in a dark place. They just they just can't live their life without playing. But there are some people who just pick up their record bag and go and play just to go collect the bag. That is it. Which is sad, really. Um, but hey, I guess that's it's just a job like anything else in that regard. But yeah, that is the playground. So let me know what you think, man. Should Dixon have gone? If you're an Innovisions fan, do you think Dixon should have gone? Did he um, disappoint you as a fan? Um, do you understand his rationale to go? Um, does the blame get put at the feet of the Tunisian promoters? Um, or does it solely lie at the feet of the Innovision head honcho, Dixon? Let me know in the comments down below. Next on the list, what do we have here? Move on in, move on deep. Da, 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 da. Yeah, yeah, let's talk about this one. Even though I don't really, you know, someone say I don't really care, and then you go on talking about it for like a ten minutes. This is probably going to be one of them. So it was announced earlier on um, this week that Lucian Clark, um, a skater with Palace and a few other places had signed for Louis Vuitton's newly formed skateboarding division. Yes, you heard that right. Louis Vuitton, the premier streetwear skateboarding brand of the 90s, a brand that was synonymous with grip tape and trucks <laughs> and Allen keys and skate tools, right? A, a brand that goes hand in hand with Fresher had finally snapped up one of the hot prospects on the skateboarding scene, <coughs> Lucian Clark. Of course, that's not true. Louis Vuitton has as much to do with skateboarding as Eddie Murphy has to do with graffiti. But we are where we are, isn't it? So news has got revealed. Lucian's got his own signature shoe. And I don't give a shit. I really don't. I don't care. I think the shoe looks like shit. I think it's a bad idea. I think it sends out the wrong message. I don't like anything about it. And I'm going to tell you why. I really shouldn't be bothered about it. It's not really me. It's not aimed at someone like myself. But it just really, really, really pisses me off. Number one, because I feel as if some people in skateboarding have such a weird obsession with fashion. They are so enamored with that scene, with that industry. Mostly it has to do with, you know, um, skaters loving smashing bloody models and stuff right because you know models love a bad boy and there's no better poser bad boy than a skater pretending to be a bad man right people love that they love that kind of hard attitude of a couple sovereigns acting hard gold tooth whack, crap tattoos right get, model girls tend to love that kind of stuff so i get it right models love skaters skaters love models it's a match made in heaven but over the years it seems like the actual industry the people involved um with with them skateboarding the movers and the shakers the people at the core no pun intended are also trying to line themselves up with fashion people or get themselves aligned with the menswear groups and the menswear contingent it's just really odd odd for me because i remember when i was coming up and i was starting to skate when i was 14 13 like one of the again this was back in the day so there weren't a lot of black people skating in, in in general not a lot of black people from ends either so when i'd go to slam when i'd go to these conventions when i'd go to base 66 when i'd go to these skate parks when i'd go and see these people at these events at these bars and pubs they would vibe me the fuck out they'd be so rude they'd be so just shitty people to hang about with and treat me with such disrespect especially at that time when i was that young wide-eyed eager to get involved and these were adults these are grown adults who didn't really want to you know make room for the young kids coming in or just didn't really like my vibe whatever i don't know i hardly even spoke during those eras i was just trying to soak up game and just be around people but they were so shitty like terrible people horrible people i met some good eggs here and there but for the most part some of the, especially some of the guys that slam city skates the, it, just, it took like 10 years for those guys even to say hi to me when i was going to that store and i was going in there before the dunk sb thing was a thing right i was going in there just in general to buy stuff right to buy boards to buy you know grip tape to just hang out in the shop maybe pick up a magazine or two pick up a free zine like that gray zine back in the day i was just trying to get myself involved in it but they didn't want to know didn't want to know then of course time progresses and these new kids come out these kind of hype beasty rich kids from Labrook Grove come out. Some of them end up starting brands like Palace and they kind of, you know, um, um, fetishize this working class aesthetic um, to kind of give themselves some sort of edge, which I think it's extremely cringe, but do your thing. And they completely blow up. And all these older folk who are the ones pushing people like myself out and icing us out were welcoming these guys with open arms. And now these guys are the ones that are now kind of pushing towards aligning themselves with the glitzy fashion world. And the thing that's odd about the fashion world is that these fashion people wouldn't piss on us if we were on fire. 
legitimately, right? I've worked in each industry. I've had a bit of a taste of working in each segment and I know what they say about people like us behind our backs, right? If we like, just just imagine trying to rock up to a Louis Vuitton store now with your, with your, with your skateboard after a session at Myland, right? wearing non streetwear bits, actually wearing core streetwear brand, head to toe. I mean, core skateboarding brand, head to toe, nothing fashion-y. And imagine trying to rock up there and trying to buy something and see the looks you'd get, especially if you were somebody of my complexion. It just isn't a vibe. So to somehow suggest that um, Louis Vuitton are skate-friendly and have some sort of affinity with skateboarding because they happen to have Virgil at the head honcho seat of Louis Vuitton, which makes, you know, just about as much sense as me designing UFC gear. Because I watch it doesn't mean I know anything about it, right? Can Virgil even ollie up a curb and he's blipping, leading a flipping skateboarding division at Louis Vuitton? It doesn't make sense, mate. It really doesn't. None of it makes sense. But again, what do I know? So this is from Hype Beast. It says Lucian Clark reveals his signature uh, Louis Vuitton skate shoe. You got a picture of him holding him. Another picture. You got an absolutely corny, like cringe image of a money table with the shoes on the box there, which you know they can do what they want with it. Um, Lucian uh, Clark has seen the build on Instagram the signature Louis Vuitton skate shoe, marking the first piece of skateboarding footwear in the French fashion houses 166 history, as if it's some sort of achievement. They're a leather goods company, right? That has now kind of transitioned into making ready to wear. It's not that big of a deal that they didn't have skateboarding within 166 history. It's just like, <clears throat> and again, it's just so heavy handed, isn't it? It really is. Um, would Jake Phelps, would, would Jake Phelps have approved of this advertisement with Vince Fresher if he was alive? Who knows? But again, come on, really? A lot of y'all is still sounding like last year. The game need change and I'm the motherfucking cash. That outfit is at least what? 10 grand? Maybe 20? Unless they're gonna come out and say, "Hey, we've got a we've got an LVSB brand that we're bringing out where everything's under under two hundred pounds." This would let this would definitely be maybe the most high ticket skateboarding brand on the market without a doubt. Hundred percent. It'll be much more than what was that brand that Musk had for a bit. He collabed with some really high falutin brand, and the clothes were super expensive. This was when he was wearing Rick and shit. Oh, I forgot what it was, man. And he's wearing Boris. He used to rock. He did a collaboration with his brand that, like, the prices were insane. This is definitely gonna be up there. What do you think is gonna? What do you think is gonna be priced at this? This stuff. What do you think? The shoes on their own. What do you think they're gonna price the shoes at? It's just mad, bro. Absolutely mad that this is like a a celebrated thing. Don't get me wrong. For the guy himself, I don't know. If if you're his friend, congratulations. I don't know the guy, so I don't really care. But whatever. I guess it's a good thing. But overall, as a, if you're a fan of skateboarding, it's like. And again, for myself, like, it's just like, wow, man. Like, the it's just like, <laughs> I was this guy back in the day, right? Trying to get involved, trying to hang around. And you, they iced you out, right? Mostly, again, mostly white middle-aged men icing you out of the scene because they don't want to get you in. They don't want to get you involved. Then suddenly this dusty skateboard brand comes along like Palace. They start filming everything in, v in VHS. They start having kids hanging around with sovereigns and wearing sweatpants with loafers, uh, you know edgy boys and then suddenly suddenly the floodgates open suddenly they want to welcome everybody in the scene like oh god almighty so it's uh, virgil's post regarding it he says i'm just signed jamaica's own all right cringe he's on the oh, i don't blame virgil because virgil's on his whole black lives matter redemption tour right he's, he's been doing all these initiatives and actions in order to kind of prove that he's a ally to black people which is you know i don't know i guess it appeals to the work crowd but i don't blame him for putting jamaica's own in front of there do you ever look at lucian and think of a jamaican i don't know maybe if you follow him on instagram he's talking about jamaica but i never even knew that was a thing but fair enough just signed jamaica's own lucian clark to louis vuitton as a first skater deal of this type it gave him free reign to design his pro model been filming clips for a year now first official advert is in the fresher that's shipping in a second okay cool man i guess isn't it it's all a bit cringe to me um a table full of money whatever louis vuitton skate shoes makes sense um it's all it's, it's a brilliant idea right isn't it a brilliant idea 900 pound shoes 10 grand outfit this is what all skaters want in it really isn't it god almighty what next like uh bloody um graph friendly louis vuitton bags like 
Um, says that from what can be seen, this is just a title of feature. So what can be seen, Clark and Abelow's teasers post, the design channel's puffy 90s uh, silhouette with a layered mesh and suede upper with features. Clark's full name scrolls on a lateral mid for an, an LV hit on the tongue. Midsoles are thick, semi-translucent. A final LV stamp also appears on the rear on the outsole. Both black and orange and green and grey colors were uh, teased by the skater and the designer. Apart from his on-brand exploits, the Jamaican, why do they keep saying Jamaican-born London base? Is that like a thing? Can I say Angolan born London based? Can I say that? Is it, is that the thing that people are doing now? To give themselves more like, you know, um uh minority points. This is a bloody odd place that we live in this world, isn't it? Look, Jamaican born London based. Odd? Oh, that's what I am now. Angolan born London based. Uh Palace sponsored clerk has also modeled Louis Vuitton looks book. Looks his runway shows and been the face of many palace campaigns further for more information on silhouettes has yet to be revealed. But yeah, I don't I, again man, it's just it's just funny, man. It's just funny. Back in the day when we were trying to get involved, slam six gates with ice like imagine what those flipping what was that short guy in slam that was really angry all the time? And always a bit of a cunt and he warmed up over a period of time, but he was a bit of a dick in the beginning all the time. I forgot his name. Like, imagine what he would have thought of back in the days. You rocked up in a pair of... You, did, this is as dumb as... I remember one time when I had... Um, I was doing a review of the Balenciaga Triple S's that I have. Right? You know the shoe. <coughs> well, I hope you do anyway. Let me get up on here. Balenciaga Triple S Black Red. Right? I've got a pair of these Balenciaga Black and Reds. Probably, you know, one of the first people to get them. Doesn't really matter. It's a really ugly fashion shoe. I got them because I like them and I'm in love with them and everything that he does. But I've got a pair of these, right? And I did a review of them on my channel. It's somewhere there. Search for it or find it. Um, and some kid messaged me earnestly, right? And asked if these shoes were good for running. They asked, hey, are these shoes good for running? Is this a good running shoe? And again, I'm okay with kids emailing me, asking me questions. They do all the time. And I try and give back because I think when I was coming up, the, the olders were fucking cunts. Like I mentioned about the Slam City Skates and that whole skate crew, you know, document team, all these people. I used to go to some, I used to go to like, you know, magazine launches and stuff and just get completely disrespected. But hey, I was in love with skateboarding, still am, and didn't want to, I just want to be around it. But I know, I know now what not to do with youngers, right? I'll give them the game. I'll give them whatever knowledge I have. And I was like, no, it's not a good running shoe at all. Like the whole, the concept of the shoe, you know, essentially takes it away from being a good running shoe because it's got free soles stacked on top of it, right? Triple sole. Um, it's a it's a fashion shoe, and um, in general, I always tell people like, if you're gonna buy a sneaker, buy a sneaker from an actual athletics or sportswear brand, right? They do them the best. Don't buy the trainer um, variant of it from a fashion. Don't buy the ver the fashion variation of it from a fashion brand. It makes no sense. But that was a genuine question. They asked me, hey, do you think the shoes would be good for running? That's about as good as saying, you know, do you think that Louis Vuitton shoe would be good for skating? What do they know about flipping skating? Nothing whatsoever. Zero. Just about as much as I know about, you know, I don't know, designing bloody kits for an Olympic team. It makes no sense. It makes no sense. And again, maybe it's just a period, you know, time evolves, things change. But it's just interesting to see that the way I was treated, the way the people that I hung out was treated when we came up in the scene, it's completely opposite of what's going on now. If anything, they're embracing all the kind of... um you call them fuckboys, right? The fashion fuckboys, the guys that kind of sit around with their legs a certain direction and wear all these um, trinkets on the side of their jeans. And they always seem to have like, you know, they always seem to have that sad face and shit. They love those kids now, right? And when we were, the, we were that, and we were those versions of those kids when we were younger, right? We had our little thing, but they didn't want us around. And now they want Louis Vuitton sneakers that are going to be priced at 900 pounds, you know, going up into skate stores. And again, what are they going to do? They're going to make like a fake. Imagine, imagine they put, imagine Louis Vuitton, you could imagine Virgil makes a, a pop-up store with a mini ramp in it and shit. Like how cringe that would be. Seeing all the dusty skaters around trying to frolic and, um, you know, uh, dance around and frolic with the fashion crew people who are trying to pretend like they're down and they don't mind that energy. Because when, when, when skate, if you've been to an actual real skate launch event, you know how rowdy they get and how naughty some of those guys can get. So I can only imagine how much of those guys will put up with it. And again, just thinking about it too, it's also a complete opposite to what they've done previously. Do you remember that case, that story about Louis Vuitton suing that kid that did a suicide like, is it a drop or something at some store in LA somewhere, right? Do you remember? He got fined like $30,000 or something, had to go do community service because he decided to do a, tr a trick off of a Louis Vuitton store sign. Do you remember that? If you don't, I think there's a little clip here that kind of details a bit of it. And now this brand has decided that they're the friends of skateboarding. It's just so cringe. Makes absolutely no sense. The hypocrisy here is incredible. 
But again, what do you expect, isn't it? They're trying to tap into the core. They want the youth market, so they have to do what they have to do, isn't it? But for me, for me, not not thank you. That's what I say in this regard. Let me see if I can get up here. It's loading. It's taking a while because my computer's slow. Maybe if I had those Louis Vuitton skate shoes on, it'll go a bit quicker, innit? <laughs> oh, it's so dead. So bloody dead, man. <laughs> oh, this scene is amazing, man. It, it just makes me laugh. Man. This is a yeah, this is it. You see it? When I did that, Absolutely no finesse with it as well, isn't it? Right? He climbs over the side of it outside of the store and skate off of it. But I'm when I did that, and just jumps down. Sure I didn't break anything. And they sued him. And I think he did community service. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he did community service. He had to pay a fine. This is um the friend of skateboarding, by the way. Yeah, Louis Vuitton, skateboarding's friend, well-known skateboarding brand. God on my. But anyway, maybe I'm wrong, man. Maybe I'm wrong. Let me know in the comments down below. Do you think the Louis Vuitton skateboarding shoe is a good idea? Um, are you happy with it? Um, what do you think it's going to be priced at? Will you buy a pair? Um, do you care? Um, would Jake Phelps have featured them if they if he was still alive now? Let me know in the comments below. And oh, and if he was around during those days, right back in the day, right when Sidewalk Magazine was an actual magazine, right? Were you around those days when I was about, right? Were you about? Do you know what happened? Did you see what happened? Am I maybe just remembering it wrong? Um, am I mischaracterizing people? Um, but, and, and again, maybe skateboarding has always been like that, right? I think it has. It's a thing, right? Everyone gets vibed out. But I'm just talking about sustained vibed out. Even when I reached the age of like 18, 21, these guys are still acting like dicks to me. And they see me every weekend coming into the store, you know, um, going to expos and stuff it's just making any sense but regardless let me know in the comments down below what your thoughts and opinions are i'd love to know what you guys think <laughs> okay um i think that might be it you know what else da, 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 da. yeah i think that might be it that might be it let's end it there because we're already over an hour and 20 i don't want to waste too much more of your time so this has been the Zing show episode number three six one that's tres says uno um Thank you so much for joining the show. As per usual, if you want to support the show, please click Patreon down below. The Patreon link is in the show descriptions. It's Agostino Zinga. It's Agostino, all one word. Patreon.com for just Agostino. Patreon.com for just Agostino. Support the show for as little as $1 or pound. Uh, 20 per month to get access to my entire library of course if you're watching via youtube please smash that like hit subscribe and leave me a comment down below if you're listening via the podcast app, give me a five star review and share the show with your friends and until then i'll see you guys very very soon take care be safe and um all that good stuff in it oh of course follow me on social too social follow me on social social links down below too and yeah take care be safe and see you guys very soon bye